from the Cyber Hub Bunker and Studio. You're listening to the CISO Talk Podcast. No sales, no bullshit, just straight talk. Straight talk. And now for your host and CISO, James Azar. So the original clip of this song is like two minutes long, and I just want that background music to play the entire podcast, right? Because it's got like that little yep. like guitar thing. Welcome mm-hmm. to the Sissel Talk Podcast, Veteran November episode. These are uh, it's Thanksgiving week, and these are my Thanksgiving day. My birthday was Saturday, and so um, I'm bringing on uh, all of this week people who've had an impact on me personally and my professional development, and <laughs> well. If if I need to introduce this person, folks, you you haven't been paying attention to my show a lot. Vladimir, welcome to the podcast, buddy. Thanks, James. Great to be on your podcast again. So I was so looking forward to speaking with you again. We always have great conversations. Me too. You know, I'm so happy to have you on the show, especially as uh, as a person who's had a. Um, I keep telling people like, if you wanna, if you're if you're an aspiring CISO and you go. Where do I start? And I'm like, well, go back and listen to the podcast with Vladimir because Vladimir pretty much laid it out right there. How do you get started? How do you start addressing security? And then how do you build? The foundation exists in that hour and 15 minutes of conversation uh, enjoyed over an espresso early on. Um, that that was just delicious, by the way. <laughs> I can't remember if that was Honduran or Nicaraguan. It, it was Nicaraguan. Nicaraguan. It was yeah. Nicaraguan. It was for sure Nicaraguan. Yeah, um, I've got. I've now. I now hand make my espressos. So, I I, I get the beans. I, I can oh, you roast. grind them. I grind them myself. I pack them in. I've I've increased my espresso game. Um, like a CISO, you always got to get better with your coffee game, right? You got to get better with your security game. You got to get better with your coffee game. You can't Absolutely. stand still. The world will forget you. You'll still be doing filtered coffee with the you know old white filters that drip the coffee. That's just not 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 the thing anymore. So, um, Vladimir, you're a Marine. Tell us a little bit about your uh, your your veteran no- like as as part of Veteran November, obviously highlighting veterans, folks. Vladimir, who was previously the CISO over at the Georgia Lottery, making sure that none of us made any money when we played the lottery. <laughs> um, <laughs> Actually, that, that that may have been a peer of mine over the Department of Revenue. We made sure they yeah. got their cut. Yeah, it, it used to be like today could be the day, but today would also be you know his day. Is that is, did I did I butcher it? No, that's right. Because right. when I got up and I said today could be the day, he would get up and say, "If today is the day for you, it's also my day." Yeah, it's also that's that's wonderful, right? Taxation without any representation. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Vlad, tell our audience a little bit about your background in the service, and 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 um, you know, you're a Marine, so we'll 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 we'll, we'll leave it at that. Okay, so I was 17 when I joined the Marines. Uh, I joined the Marines with a friend of mine, and we all agreed to join back when we were in kindergarten. There was four of us, and two of us were kind of gung-ho, and two of us were kind of quiet. The two quiet ones actually ended up joining the Marines. So I was 17. I went to boot camp in San Diego, and then after that, I was stationed at Camp Lejeune, and I ended up being a radio communications operator. Uh, Spent some good time there, time in Okinawa, Japan, and I ended up being a communications instructor. And after a while, people started seeing or questioning my background, and they knew I could speak, read, and write Russian. So they moved me into a different area of the Marine Corps that were, was beneficial for me being a linguist. So I spent some time in the old Soviet Union, went back to uh, after 91, which was when the Put or the coup occurred. So I've been to Russia twice, Norway, Korea a couple times. Had a wonderful time there. Uh, I learned a lot of things there. I grew up a lot there, and I started learning about foundation. I started learning about the foundations of structure, organization, and dealing with various people, people of different gender, different culture, different race, even different countries that come to join the military, as you're quite well aware, James, serving in the Army. It's not the Marine Corps, I know, I know. (laughs) But we still have Yeah, but it's all fighting for... Yep. We, well, <laughs> still have a football team. 
Well, we all start, we, we all started out anyway with our eyes focused on one thing, and that's support and defend the Constitution of the United States. So we started yes. learning a lot more about the, this country and the freedoms and the freedoms, partial freedoms that we sacrificed or gave up temporarily so that we can defend them. Yeah, there's uh, there's a great history when serving our our nation that that you kind of learn and you see and you see that I think when you're in the military, you see the best of this country every single day, irregardless of the politics, right? Forget the politics and all that stuff. Just when you look at the people around you, that's the best this nation has. Mission oriented. They yeah. get the mission. They find it no matter what obstacles. And we have we have come across so many obstacles as we do in cybersecurity. We come across come to these obstacles, but we're not. Even though we're astonished or maybe sometimes surprised, we're not stunned into inaction. We absorb it and we start right now formulating, compensating controls, workarounds, adapting to it and getting through it so we can meet that goal, whether strategic or tactical. Talk a little bit about how you ended up in cyber. What was your transition like after after 17 years in the core and, and, and what did you end up Ten doing? Years. 10 years, sorry, 10 years. I don't know why I thought 17. I'm thinking 17, I don't know why. Because um, I was 17 when I joined. That's right, that's right. So 10 years, you get out, what do you do? Ooh, that was kind of difficult. And there's that shock I was t telling you about. I was like, all of a sudden, boom, but I wasn't stunned into inaction. I thought, okay, wow, this is something. I heard I have to lose all the military jargon. I have to quit the, the regimentation. And I have to listen a lot more. And I have to understand people a lot more as well. I didn't have a problem in the military because they were of different race and gender and culture and backgrounds, different parts of the country, different parts of the world. Now I got to do that in the business industry. So I started to spend more time listening and talking and started asking more questions than directing opinions. And, and, and that tr transition took a little bit. And it's a good thing I went to work for a government contractor that was serving the Marines and the Army. Because it's like I still had a connection with the military by working as a contractor and serving those elements, but I was a civilian. So it's kind of like I had my foot on both sides of the fence, if you will. Right. But that's a lot of transition people, especially people that come with our background or people that are like our signal, intel, and so forth. Even when you're leaving, you typically end up in, in the, the defense industrial complex for a little while. Um, and then you're there until you're not there anymore until you're ready to really break away to to the private sector and, and really become a private citizen again um and how long were you um how long did it take you to become a 100 percent private citizen there five years wow five years as a government contractor and then there was a certain point towards the latter end of those five years i started thinking okay this is the same thing as a military in certain regards where there's a contract there, you know, like a contract, like when you enlist and it's going to end, it has to be, you know, renegotiated and you go again. And I started going, you know, it's time for me to really punch out and really join the community from which I came when I was a young teenager and join it, the community and be productive in the community, in my local community and also the state and the country and see what I can do in there and rejoin the population, so to speak. So it was about five years and I started looking, going, you know, I need to get out. Totally. Cut the cord, I called it. <laughs> well, it is. You know, one of the things I've highlighted in these episodes this month is a lot of the people who, let's say, serve 10, 12, 17 years and then go to the defense industrial complex, they continue to serve the nation. And oftentimes people look at like the contractors that, that the government contractors and go, well, they're private citizens. Yeah, but they're private citizens that are serving our nation. Um, they're they're no different than yeah they're not combat soldiers right but they're just as mission critical if not more sometimes than some of the guys that are you know running into the fire um, and 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 going into a hot zone uh, t you know to to uh, to protect our freedoms and, and and defend our constitution like so so technically yes you were enlisted for ten years but you served for fifteen right. Does that make and you're sense? absolutely right. Yes, it makes great sense. And that's and the criticality of, of those government contractors are really important too because I watched the F-22 subassembly plant and I, that's when I was a total civilian. But uh, we were contracted to build the subassembly plant 
from the F-22s and you see everybody working there, a lot of veterans there, and they were vital in making sure that when a pilot gets in that cockpit, that the canopy is going to seal, that the wings are going to be attached properly, that the engine is not going to fail them. That's kind of important. Yes, it's important to have the training to operate all those things, but what about ensuring the integrity of that aircraft or to make sure an Amtrak totally seals so when it is thrown off of the back of a ship and dives down 20 feet and resurfaces, that it does resurface with all the Marines inside of it, or that a tank does seal. So yeah. it's, it's quite important. I've um, interviewed several Air Force pilots and, and just pilots in my, in, in, in my career, and I've always asked them, uh, who was, uh, what was the most important thing before ever flying? And they go, I had one mechanic, and if he didn't look at the plane, I wasn't flying it. I had one guy who would do the quality check before I got in the cockpit and flew that aircraft. And if that person wasn't there, if that person wasn't the person inspecting it, I wasn't doing it. I wasn't getting in that cockpit until that person inspected it because I trusted him to ensure that, like you said, the engine isn't going to bail out. The landing gears aren't going to have any issues. You know, the weapons are properly, um, you know, stored. Um, there, there's there's aspects to that that are that are critically important that that oftentimes aren't um, you know we, we all remember Top Gun and we go oh look at the squad but you know well well you know the pilots were important and they are critical um, the people who upkeep their uh, flying aircrafts are just as critical right if not more so what was what was difficult for you about your transition what what did you kind of uh, when when you decided to cut the cord five years in and go completely private, what was that transition like? The transition was, was I was like in a foreign place. It was as if I was going to boot camp for the first time, except I knew that it wasn't going to be that treacherous. But it was like, I'm in a different world, and I need to understand what the environment is, what the atmosphere is, what the culture is. So how do I do that in the culture? I was thinking, well, first of all, I need to establish relationships, just friendly, professional relationships and get to know people and get to know what they do and how my role fits into what they do and the organization at, at large. Now, in doing that, I had to, to establish those relationships and understand the culture. I had to communicate. So I had to learn communication skills. And I don't think it's just business communication skills or professional or personal. It's in general just communicating with people. If you can communicate with people in some kind of manner that you can both share ideas and share thoughts together so you can collaborate and understand, then I think it, it makes the goal, your goal and their goal, kind of blend together as one. You can understand each other. So I think the biggest challenge was getting to understand the atmosphere, the environment, and the culture. And I had to do that by creating relationships, by communicating learning how to communicate so you know one of the challenges we talk about when people are discharged and they're going into a civilian world and kind of stepping into outside of the military regimen and the military routine is is kind of the resources were there any resources available at the time to help you and did you use any of them i didn't use any because i was thinking you know i need to do this on my own number one but number two, they weren't. Okay, so so let me stop you for a second. I need to do this on my own. A lot of people say that. <clears throat> tell me the t tell me the uh, tell me the rationalization behind. I need to do this on my own, and then what you did to to make it happen on your own. Because a lot of times people say I need to do this on my own, but then they don't know how to put that together. You were able to successfully put it together. So so share that secret sauce with us there for a minute. Secret sauce. <laughs> <laughs> You thought so, you were going to get an easy question today, Vladimir. No. No easy <laughs> yeah, question Yeah, I, I, I did. Right. <laughs> so you remember, as, as well as I do, and all, of my, all our peer veterans, every day, every week, every month, there's a plan of the day. Sometimes it's listed for a month in advance, a week, or just the day. And every day in the military, you would find a list of things that were going to occur from 07 to 08, 08 to 09. 0, 09 to 10, it was going to say what was going to occur, at what time, at what location, how you were going to get there, what uniform to wear, 
And then there was a point of contact if you had any issues with attending any of those things. So basically, it's like all I have to do is follow that thing and I'm good. I'm out in the civilian world. So no one told me what to do, where to go, you know, what to wear, how to get there, and what the points of contact are if I have any conflicts. I have to figure that out all on my own. And I was 28 when I got out. So here I am, and I have a job description, and that's it, and there's your desk. Okay. Well, how do I figure that out? And I think going back to what I said previously is establishing that communication platform. So I had to really learn how to communicate with people because if I didn't learn how to communicate with people, I couldn't establish a relationship. And then if I couldn't establish a relationship, I couldn't understand the culture, the culture of my department, my role, the culture of the business or the company or the industry that the company is in. And I was just going to sit there and go, um, can someone tell me what to do next? I couldn't do that. Yeah, I had to take some initiative, and the initiative was started that communication, finding that even keel communication between myself and my supervisor, my peers, and everybody around me. So I think that's how I just force myself into the communication so I can learn the culture and establish yeah. relationships. I mean, that's that, 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 that was the issue. So when I saw that list of things in the, in the military, and I got out, and it was like, you're on your own. Yeah, I mean... So, so I'll say this to people listening because we, we, we've had so many inspiring stories over, over, you know, the last, you know, 20 some odd episodes and we've got 10 more to go. And I, I tell, I tell everyone, that, you know, kind of a lot of people, when you go on your own, you have to know where you're going. Um, because if you go on your own, on your own and you don't know where you're going, you're going to end up down a rabbit hole and it's not going to be very good and like you said you said i knew where i was going i'm focusing on how do i align my communication because you know my wife says this you said it i think i remember when we were at one place you guys said it simultaneously was almost gnarly scary but you said it's not what you say it's how you say it so listen more talk less and then align your communication with whoever's across from you which by the way for a lot of us is a problem I still, I still experience challenges with aligning my communication sometimes. You know, I work in so many different sectors. And so I'll find myself that when I'm, you know, in AFSIA and we're, you know, we're, I'm talking to the, uh, you know, Lieutenant General of the Georgia National Guard, uh, you know, i am got to go back to my military. Yes, sir. No, sir. Yes. You know, um, I, don't, I don't say, you know, 8 p.m. I say, you know. 2100 you know 9 p.m let's say 2100 hours right or say you know right. let's talk at 07 30 like like th that's what you talk because if i told him let's talk at 7 30 a.m he's going to be like azar did you forget your roots right <laughs> and then and then you you go to to the civilian world and i'll write 1400 in an email and be like people will reply and be like what's 1400 and they'll call you james whereas yeah. the general will call you azar, azar. yeah Right. So, so I still have a challenge with that because when I'm heavily immersed in one of the other environment, I have an adjustment period even today. And I'm now 15 years out. Seven to your years. audience. Yeah. 15, 16 years out. Like you still challenge, you're still experiencing that challenge. Um, b b simply because when you're immersed in it, like I say, I'm out, but I've never really been out, right? Like you're never really out. Um, you know, it, it's, it's just, but, but that communication piece is so important. Know your audience. And, you know, I tried, I try to do that, but I'm, you know, I'll still admit I'm not perfect at it. What did you do to make yourself really good at it? Cause uh, t to me, you're the, um, you kind of transition into cyber and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But today you, you, you've held the title of CISO for multiple organizations. Um, you've been extremely successful in your roles. Um, and so, so I'm kind of trying to understand that mindset. I want to copy that success a little bit on the podcast, if you don't mind. So when you know your audience, our history in the military, we were always taught, know your enemy, right? You know, your enemy, then you know how, you can look to different ways to defeat them strategically, operationally, administratively, just defeat them. So in this way, we're not knowing our enemy. We're learning about our audience. And we do that through that relationship, culture, and communication. We learn our audience. We learn about them. 
and we identify with them. If we can learn about our audience by listening a lot more, we can identify with them, then we can apply our backgrounds in such a way that we can collaborate and work together as a real team and not just two individuals side by side, but as really like, yep, I get you. Yep, already working on it. And they're doing the same for you. So that that's the strengthening that I had there is knowing my audience and getting to know them and caring. If you care about it, if you care about them, they'll realize it because you can look at anybody's eyes while they're talking. Are they just talking or are they really listening because they care? If they care, they care about you and the relationship, culture and communication and they have a vested interest of the success of the organization. And I think that's a great starting point, the foundation. And even if something does happen, you can still rebuild from that base. So talk a little bit about cyber. How'd you get into cyber? What was that journey like? Cyber was easy. Um, we started doing it a long time. We did it in the military. In the previous podcast, I mentioned how in the military, you know, you answer the phone, you say, be advised, this is an unsecured line. May I help you, sir or ma'am? And we started out with passwords, you know, back in the 90s when I got out. And then one time when I was at IT management, I was asking an end user for their password so I can adjust their profile that they wanted adjusted in a certain way. And I asked her for her password young lady and she said i'm not giving you my password and i thought well i got it you know you want me to fix this she goes you can reset it and then do your thing and then i'll change it back but i'm not giving you my password later on i started thinking about that and that's the advanced cyber the basic thing is yeah we all knew about keeping your credit card pin numbers and all that and you have password and you change it you don't tell anybody but just because I was in IT didn't mean I needed to know someone's password. So that gave me a different level of understanding a long time ago, thinking, yeah, we don't need that. She's right. So that, while I was in IT, and I started looking around and started observing various things that people were doing, and I was like, well, you know, you have that wide open on your screen. I mean, you want to, like, protect that somehow, maybe put a, a privacy screen on it or lock your screen you know, while you're away or going to the printer or something. So I started putting all that into play and I, it started taking me back to what I did in the military. Now, when I, when I fully transitioned to civilian life, I actually tried to separate myself from my previous past, my military, because, you know, people look at military as different, especially Marines. Oh, all you do is you're, grunt, you're grunts. That's all you are. You know, you know, no intelligence, no understanding. You're just military. You're over there. So I try to divest myself from that stigma or that uh, stereo stereotype but a lot of things were seeping through as far as my understanding of security because i work with a lot of secure documents you know from confidential secret and top secret and then i had to destroy them too and destroying them you know i don't know if you're familiar with back in the military days but not only did you have to burn them you step back and you have to log that you're burning them you have to have a witness that is being destroyed and you burn them in a barrel and once it's burned you pour a little water on it and mix it up and make mud out of it you can still read paper as it's floating around in the air, right? So all that kind of mentality came forth with me when I was in IT. And I was like, yeah, I can, I can do a lot of this. I can secure all this stuff. And so when opportunities open, I just put my hat in the ring. I uh, got my CISSP, my CISM, C-RISC, and uh, GSLC, it was SANS, et cetera. And I started like, yeah, I understand all this. And what's interesting enough is that Sean Harris wrote a nice big 900 page book she's former air force uh god rest her soul she passed i think in 2014 but she wrote a very famous book on studying for the cissp and there was also the one from isc square well the isc square test was based on the isc square book so i needed that one but i read hers former air force so i can understand what i was reading and the way she put it and the way she laid it out she was able to communicate isc square's book to me in a way that I can understand. And I really started engaging there a lot more in the communication going, okay, we need to make sure communication is front brain and not something we tack on. That's how we approach things. So cybersecurity is where, I, that's how I got into cybersecurity. And I found out a lot of the things I was doing, I already had the understanding of. So it was kind of like innate from 10 years in the Marines and the five years subsequent as a government contractor. And I really enjoyed the people I was working with. And I started to notice that there were a lot of veterans in the cybersecurity industry. 
And we notice that there's a cohesiveness between us in communications, relationships, and culture. And we started getting along so well, no matter what industry we, we were, no matter what our titles were, if it was assistant VP or director or CISO, whatever it may be, but we all got along and we all shared, we all communicated. And we don't think of ourselves as being, well, I've got this and you don't, and et cetera. It was all like everything I have, it's yours. When it comes to security, it's everything I have, it's yours. And everybody was sharing. And I think that's what keeps me in cybersecurity. Yeah, you've, you've, you're, you're how long has your career in cyber spanned now? Six years. Coming up on seven. You've been, um, explicitly that is. But I started it in 1987 or 86, about 1986. Yeah, wow there weren't computers back then no i remember the first k pro computer that was a fold away from a big cabinet on a 300 on a 300 dpi hercules screen yeah i mean that's how our voting machines look today <laughs> <laughs> you're right and i kept log books and i kept log books and i remember i had to hide those log books and lock them in the cabinet and lock them in the desk and our office was used as the officer of the day, you know, uh, command center during the evening hour. So everything was locked up, but also they were charged with maintaining that security as well. Yeah. Well, w welcome to, uh, to, to the world of cyber for many people who, who want to go into it because you've been doing it for a while. And that's one thing. If you've been in the military, cyber is going to translate really natural to you, right? Like really native um and it gives you purpose right a lot of jobs sometimes they have no purpose you're doing it you're kind of doing it for the money and you're constantly looking at your watch and going when is it five when is it five when is it five so you can go home and you know do what you really love doing whether it be playing music or something but cyber i feel like we all have purpose we don't often look at our watches like think of all of our networking events over the years we, we typically oh, wow. always like ride them out until like the bar's like hey guys um <laughs> we got shit to do y'all need to leave the cleaning crew is sitting there waiting up against the wall you know <laughs> ah, come join us <laughs> it's um it's 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 been uh it, it's a journey uh we're almost out of time and and i hate that because i wish i could do so much more with you but these are 30 minute podcasts for veteran november people people want to they give us 30 minutes and, and we got to get it across in 30 and, and, and I enjoy that. W w you know, when you look back at your time in the service, uh, what's one thing you miss? Camaraderie, the immediate camaraderie of like-minded people, not l identical people, but like-minded people. We have the same goal. We're a team, no matter what you look like, what your background and what you love today, what you aspire to, but you have one goal or two goals, but you have one direction, I should say, you have many goals, one direction. And I miss the camaraderie that no matter what, we care about each other because yeah. we know where we're going. We have direction. So November 30th, we'll be bringing that back, 6 p.m. Eastern time. Join us with your favorite alcoholic or non-caffeinated or caffeinated beverage. Um, and uh, I'll have my uh, bourbon and cigar. Um, it's veterans only. Um, link is below in the description of the podcast, folks. You can sign up there if you are a veteran. Um, I do vet you because this is non-aired, non-recorded. It is just a private veteran gathering uh, for to kind of uh, seal off veteran November. Joining me will also be Brian Lozato. He's the uh, CISO over at HBO. Vladimir, I'm sure you'll be with us. Um, Chris Cochran from Hacker Valley Studios and so many others um, that have been on the podcast and uh, many more that um, we just didn't get a chance to bring them on. And so uh, bringing back that, and, and I can't say camaraderie for the life of me. It sounds like I'm drunk when I say it. Um, it is it is the one word in the English language that I can't get right. You'll um, say it right after that bourbon. I will. After the <laughs> bourbon and the cigar, it'll be just perfect. But um, but um, uh, Vladimir, thank you for, for coming on and thank you for uh, really kind of being my silent mentor um, over the years of just the person who I can always just kind of be like, what would Vladimir do? What would be the right approach here? It's, 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 
listen, um, very, I think we all have people that we look up to in a way and we go like, all right. Um, and, and, and I see the way, um, when you speak the way people just listen and, and there's, there's an aspect to that. That's that, that just tells you a lot about the wisdom that comes out of your mouth and what you shared right now about communication over the last 30 minutes have been really eye opening. I think for a lot of people who listen, because, um, it's, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Um, and so just, you know, be mindful of what you say. A lesson I definitely needed to hear today. FYI. (laughs) I'll make sure I get this in there. Happy birthday. And I'm Thank just you. paying it forward. Thank you. You are, and you're, you're, you're one of the best um, out there, folks. Um, Vladimir, who's, who's just um, an unbelievable person, really um, uh, gives everything without expecting anything back, I would say, is, is the kind of person you are. I've seen you spend time talking to people and, and just sharing knowledge and wisdom where, where most people are like, well, I'm not telling. Um, you're, you're an open book when it comes to helping others succeed. And I think that's why you're a success. And that's why you're going to continue to be successful. And I wish you nothing but continued success, nothing but continued uh, prosperity and health and wellness. Um, you sure as hell deserve it, Vladimir. And thank you for, for agreeing to come back on the show and doing the podcast with me. And, and again, uh, just an awesome human being, guys. Um, Vladimir, uh, I hope you all enjoyed this podcast. November 30th, we'll be getting back together. More episodes this week of, 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 of people who've, uh, who've guided me. It's Thanksgiving week. So happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Happy Turkey Day. Happy Thanksgiving. Uh, remember your crazy uncle or aunt is still your crazy uncle and aunt and the Detroit Lions will still lose on Thursday um, that's an American tradition it is the The Detroit Lions have an American tradition every turkey day that is to Wayne, lose that's what happened to Wayne Fonts way back in the day he kept yeah. making it up there and then Thanksgiving Day that was it and that's what, what, that's what put an end to his career yeah. Um, so the Detroit Lions will still lose and uh, whoever and the Cowboys will, I don't know, not make it, I guess, um, I, because typically, I don't know, I haven't watched football all year, so I don't know who's playing on Thursday, but I'm assuming it's been if tradition is still the same, it's the, the Lions, the Cowboys and the Packers. That's typically who plays. Right. Yeah. Right. Those are the three teams that are like the flagship Thanksgiving teams. Right. Correct. And then they play someone. Well, I say Lions lose, Cowboys lose, Packers win. I'm in agreement there. <laughs> I just want – I like Aaron Rodgers. I don't know why. I like Aaron Rodgers. I do. I, I regret the Niners not drafting him. But that's it for us here, folks, today. Thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time, Vladimir, thank you again. Folks, more episodes. Make sure you subscribe. Let people know about the podcast and Veteran November. Make sure to comment below with any questions or comments you have on today's show. That's it. We'll be back with more tomorrow. Until then, folks, thank you so much. Stay healthy. Enjoy your Thanksgiving and stay cyber safe. Make sure to subscribe to our podcast and share it with your friends and colleagues. And get all the latest information at cyberhubpodcast.com. Cyberhub.